call the April 22, 2013 meeting of the Planning Board to order. The Board will be considering tonight's agenda in the following order. First, the approval of the minutes from the March 28th Planning Board meeting, followed by the Town Planner's Report, followed by the Robinson Woods II Resource Protection Permit, and the Golden Ridge Subdivision Amended Minor Subdivision Plan, followed by the Day Camp Zoning Amendment, then any public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, and then adjournment. So, number one, approval of the minutes. Any comments, questions on the minutes? I wasn't here, but I enjoyed reading them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would anyone like to make a motion on those minutes? Anyone that was here? Okay. Second. That is second by Carol Ann. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Okay. And um, once again, in favor? One, two, three, four. four. Okay, against, opposed, and abstaining? Abstaining, two abstaining. Okay. Next um, item is the town planner's report. I don't have much new to report. The Conservation Commission is continuing to work on the Greenbelt plan update. And the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission, and the Ordinance Committee are all working on different facets of the future Open Space Preservation Committee recommendations. Thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda is um, Cape Elizabeth Land Trust Robinson Woods II Resource Protection Permit. The Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is requesting a resource protection permit to install wetland, water crossings, and improve and install trails in the RP1 RP1 buffer and RP2 wetlands located on Robinson Woods 2 on Shore Road and at the end of Morgan Lane. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19-8-3 Resource Protection Regulations. Um, and this application will be addressed in the following format. There will be an introduction of the item by the town planner followed by a presentation by the applicant. The public is then welcome to step to the podium with any questions or comments they may have, and then the board will discuss the application, followed by a vote. Maureen, would you like to give us an overview? Sure. Uh, this is an application for a resource protection permit for portions of the trail that are located in the RP1, the RP2, and the RP1 buffer. Uh, at the last meeting, you deemed the application complete. You scheduled a public hearing for this evening. Uh, following the closing of the public hearing, you can make a decision to approve or table or deny the application. Um, and I also wanted to let you know that I have brought with me tonight, and the applicant also has uh, a copy of the section of the floodplain maps that relate to the project. Um, this project will require a floodplain permit from the code officer. I'm told it's a very routine permit, it shouldn't be difficult to obtain. And you've also received comments from the Conservation Commission. Their, their fundamental concern is that the trail be constructed in a manner that does not have muddy or erosion type conditions, especially when you're working on these type of organic soils when you start to get um, a decent amount of traffic. Uh, a sport portion gets muddy, and then what we all do is we walk around the edges, and what turns into a five-foot wide trail becomes a 20-foot wide morass. So that's it. Okay. If the uh, applicant would like to address the board, um, remind you that the meeting is being recorded, so we ask that you please state your name for the record. Sure. Uh, Chris Franklin here on behalf of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, where I serve as executive director. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, this opportunity to come back. Um, We've been working on this project for some months and um, have tried to put together uh, a, a good mix of utilizing existing pathways and improving them as opposed to developing new trails in some portions and the areas that we are going to be constructing new trails, um, trying to site those trails in such a manner so that we can minimize impact. We certainly um, <clears throat> appreciate the Conservation Commission's input um, and do share those same concerns and do welcome their participation in terms of uh, helping us uh, navigate through those. But as I said, you know, we've really tried to site these trails in, in such a manner, utilizing uh, getting up onto the uplands as quicker as possible or in areas that aren't 
necessarily wet year round is an area where we're proposing to do the bog bridging so as a <clears throat> sort of uh, preventative measure so that there'll be some structure in place um, even if it's only going to be needed a couple of months out of the year, it's better to have that in place uh, so that those areas don't become wet. And there are, honestly, some portions of the existing trail that um, are as uh, Maureen um, described that, you know, are really wet and those are areas that we do not have control over currently and it's that type of situation that we, we hope to avoid. So. Um, I'll run through some maps here quickly just to refresh your um, memory on this. Um, I guess we'll give you, is that, you want me to make that a bit bigger? Is that all right? It's fine. That's, okay. um, so coming onto the property here, this line in blue represents an existing trail. Um, the existing trail is well used and has become hard packed over the years. Um, comes down and crosses over the open water RP1 wetland uh, at this point here, goes through the woods um, and uh, crosses a stream in this general area with no structure whatsoever. You literally hop across rocks um, and then you come up the hill to a point where you the trail comes back onto the property that the land trust has acquired in uh, November, come, currently comes down here towards Beach Bluff Terrace um, and heads uphill and bisects this lot off of Cantor Way. Um, this area down here at the intersection is the, that area that has become very muddy and again is a muddy area that right now is only crossed by um, people having put down essentially rocks in the mud so you sort of puddle jump across and so we will be crossing that area but um, trying to utilize uh, better better surfacing to to avoid that uh, from widening. Uh, the new trails that we are proposing, um, there is uh, this segment here, which is approximately 1,200 feet, which follows an existing uh, pathway, which you know has been packed down a little bit, uh, which we prefer, and uh, we're told in our site visit with DEP that they would also prefer us to utilize the existing path rather than building a new one. Um, there are a couple modification areas where it gets a little close to the uh, wetland where we, just by moving it 12 feet inland or so uh, we hope to, to do that and I had outlined that in, uh, in previous maps. Um, here is the what we're calling crossing A which is the most significant crossing um, approximately the, the structure will probably be 70 or 80 feet we're asking for a bit more just for a little leeway to make sure we get to high ground on both sides but um, it's a little hard to tell, but this dark shading is the actual water. Um, and you can see there's kind of a peninsula down here that pokes into the water, whereas here it might be 250 feet across. Uh, or it would get some spots up here where it's only a 40 foot, 50 foot crossing. And as I said, we're going to try and expand that crossing a bit more, ut utilizing uh, extruded aluminum decking that sits on feet like the town has done down at Great Pond. Um, to minimize the impact. Once we're on the other side of the wetland crossing there, the topography rises quickly uh, away from the edge of the wetland. Uh, it's another 300 foot segment or so until we get back up onto uh, the existing trail. <clears throat> this sort of second half of the uh, property is a bit more constrained in that we only have a 25 foot wide parcel or piece of the parcel that we own on what we're calling the panhandle here um, but it does give us enough uh, room to meander through the larger trees so that the only vegetative clearing that we're anticipating to do is the limbing of trees rather than the removal of trees and it gives us that ability there is an existing stream uh, that comes down through here right now it is bridged in this area here by a piece of plywood um, we are proposing to upgrade uh, crossing the, of that stream to the same type of elevated al aluminum decking um, just to make something that's more permanent and more solid and really uh, do won't disintegrate and will provide uh, safer ac public access across. Um, as we get down into this portion um, 
here at the corner uh, of what we run out of the Robinson Woods True Land. When we did our acquisition, we actually negotiated this panhandle anticipating that um, we might have the ability to work with this landowner off of Cantor Way to modify this trail, recognizing the existing trail bisects a buildable lot. Um, and indeed, the landowner was interested in deeding uh, public access easement, but wanted to do so along the, the uh, southern boundary of the property uh, so that the trail could be moved and not bisect the lot. Uh, we, in that, uh, there's a low point here. There's a vernal pool in this area um, that actually has been, uh, there's a little drainage that comes out of it. And so in high water times, it drains down towards this corner a little bit and that corner gets a little bit wet. But later in the season when that pool dries up, um, it really doesn't become much of an issue. But this is the area down here where our third structure, which is basically the bog bridging is, and we're asking uh, to be able to place some permanent bog bridging in that area. Once you get away from this corner and start uh, heading back up to the west, uh, it's steadily uphill the whole way, and so you get away from that, what, that wet area uh, immediately. So um, that's the overview of the project. As it stands, we've provided uh, schematics of the materials that we'd like to use and the dimensions of the, the trails, and um, you know, looking forward to working with the town on, on getting this done. Thank you. Um, at this point, I, it is a public hearing, so I do want to open the hearing to anyone that may wish to speak on this proposal. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Um, let's see. I do want to note that, as was mentioned, we have heard from the Conservation Commission, and they did vote unanimously in support of a recommendation for this resource protection permit. And I'd like to hear from the board now. Anyone have any comments? I have a question for Chris. Yeah. Um, the, uh, lot that you said has access to it at the bottom there with the, where is that access from the, the as a buildable lot yes so those uh, you probably uh, let me see if i can pull it up a little bit uh more detail um that's not going to be your map the de -de. Pull this up a little bit. If you can see this, um, and I'll point it out here, that this lot actually, the access goes all the way down to 77. And so when these lots were constructed, they all have these squirrely little lines to get their frontage down on 77. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Questions over here? No? Um, I would just like to comment that um, this is a welcome improvement as it supports the town's vision of expanding open space and accessible trails. And I'd like to note that um, in the memo from the Conservation Committee, they did say that they are available to assist with any trail design, installation, and maintenance, along with those eighth graders, I believe, here. So <laughs> well, I'm not sure we're going to get them this year. We still have to get through the Department of Environmental Protection, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Then, at this time, would um, anyone like to make a motion? Joe. Uh, motions, <laughs> motions for the board to consider. Finding of fact. One, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is requesting a resource protection permit to install wetland and water crossings and improve and install trails in the RP1, RP1 buffer, and RP2 wetlands located on Robinson Woods. Two, Shore Road, and at the end of Morgan Lane, which requires review under Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Regulations. The Conservation Commission is recommending hardening the trail surface in muddy conditions to minimize erosion. Three, portions of the trail and crossing work are located in the A and A2 floodplain zone and will require a floodplain permit from the Code Enforcement Officer under Chapter 6-6 Floodplain Management Ordinance. Four, the application substantially complies with Section 19.8.3 Resource Protection Regulations. Therefore, be it ordered, 
that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for a resource protection permit to install wetland and water crossings and improve and install trails in the RP1, RP1 buffer, and RP2 wetlands located on Robinson Woods 2 and at the end of Morgan Lane be approved, subject to the following conditions. One, that the applicant consider trail surface hardening and other methods when the trail surface becomes muddy to avoid erosion. Two, that the applicant obtain a floodplain permit from the code enforcement officer. And do I hear a second? Second. Carol Ann, any discussion on the motion? Elaine. I have a question about um, condition one, which is slightly different from what the Conservation Commission requested and I'm curious what uh, what method what what uh, methods other than hardening might be used was there a reason why this says consider hardening and other methods rather than the more directive language that the Conservation Commission proposes I guess because there are I think it's, it's written that way because I have heard, and maybe I've, uh, I don't think I've imagined it, I've heard some reluctance by the land trust and by the uh, property owner that they purchased Robinson Woods to from, if you read their easement, there's a lot of resistance to doing anything with the trail service other than leaving it natural. And so while I wanted to capture the concept that the the concerns of the Conservation Commission I didn't want there to be an objection to this condition by stating oh it's not allowed by the easement I wanted to make it a little bit more open-ended so hardening would m might involve bringing in something else to mix with the trail that yes. would be you might different do, one of the things you might do is put down a layer of geotextile fabric and then a layer of gravel on top of that and that that hardens the surface. It you know it it makes it easier to walk without creating a muddy surface. Uh, underneath the geotextile fabric, the water should still be able to move through the, the soil. Um, but there might be some objection to doing that. So I wanted there to be some openings for other types of things. Um, you could expand boardwalk, which technically doesn't harden the surface. It adds a structure on top of the surface. So that would be another option. And, you know, they may come up with some options that we don't normally consider around here. Okay. I didn't know what the technical, what technically hardening meant. That's helpful. Thank you. If, if I could, just to, <clears throat> one of the thoughts I had in that is that as you develop these new trails, that they are somewhat softer in the beginning, and the more they're used, you know, they, they tend to cure or get hardened on their own. If you look at the... Uh, trails at Robinson Woods too that used to be in the center of the field and it was moved into the woods. You know, the first year or so that that trail was in the woods, it took a while for the vegetation to get sort of st stamped down on the path surface and now it's, you know, it's hardened to the point where vegetation won't grow in the tread of the pathway. And this, be, you know, we're, we recognize this is a sensitive area near a wetland and uh, just, you know, to the issue of bikes, you know, we, we're not going to allow the types of uses that are going to chew this place up. You know, if we're having a problem with the area being too wet for bikes or for certain uses, you know, that's wholly within our purview to, to manage that and we'll want to do that. So. Okay. Anyone have any other further comments before we take a vote? No? Uh, then, all those in favor? Oppose? And that passes unanimously. Six to nothing. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay, the next item on our agenda is uh, Golden Ridge subdivision, a three lot subdivision reapproval. Golden Ridge LLC is requesting reapproval of a three lot subdivision located at the end of Golden Ridge Lane. The subdivision plan was approved with conditions by the planning board on June 19th, 2012, and then approval was extended on October 16th, 2012. 
The extension expired on January 14, 2013. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 16-2-3, Minor Subdivision Review. The application will be addressed in the following format. Uh, the town planner will provide an overview, followed by a presentation by the applicant. The board will then determine if the application is complete, and if the applica application is deemed complete, then further review of the application may begin. Okay, and then we've got, you know how to move this around. And, and we'll no, just wait no, for more. We have to her. Okay, okay, then we'll stop for a second. Um, My name is... If you can just wait just one moment um, at this stage. Maureen, could you please provide the board with an overview? Thank you. So this should look familiar. You've seen it before. I actually have notes on this one because um, it has an interesting history. Uh, but the board approved two lots at the end of Golden Ridge Lane prior to October of 2011. And then um, there was a question by a board member who is not here tonight about the movement of a drainage line. And there was a drainage line that was fixed on the property and the drainage divide was important because if you have a drainage divide and it separates the property, you can actually reduce your buffer from your RP1 wetland. So if you look at this property on the uh, right side or what you call the eastern side, there is an RP1 wetland and there's a 250 foot buffer extending west from that. However, it hits a drainage divide, so anything on the other side of the drainage divide doesn't have to meet that, that buffer. It's based, the buffer stops at the drainage divide. And at the time, the information that we had showed the drainage divide is basically being where Golden Ridge Lane is. Um, better information came in, new consultants looked at it, and it became obvious, and I think the board was out there at a meeting, that the drainage divide had actually moved over enough that it created a, an opportunity for a third building lot. So the applicant came back in October of 2011, and the planning board approved that extra lot. And in the process of approving that extra lot, the prior approval for the two lots expired. So you granted an approval for three lots. Um, that approval included a pedestrian easement. The applicant was not willing to grant that. A lawsuit was filed. Uh, the planning board had another meeting with the town attorney in February 2012. And in June of 2012, you granted an approval for the project without the pedestrian easement. Um, that approval was extended in October of 2012. And then it expired, unfortunately, um, January 14, 2013. So the applicant is here tonight to ask the board to grant approval for the same plans that you granted approval for in June of 2012. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Please proceed. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Lee Lowry. I'm an attorney at Jensen and Baird, and I'm here on behalf of the applicant Golden Ridge LLC. And thank you for having us on the agenda. And thank you, uh, Maureen, for the history historical run we appreciate it um, and I assume the, the app uh, the project is pretty familiar to this board I think a number of the members are were on the board at the time that this went through the process so just a brief summary it's a 10 acre lot of land it is a an existing and approved lot on a subdivision plan done I think in 2003 for K and K uh, development or the, the Kennedys owned the property. Uh, that project, uh, the, the final approval of it, there was work associated that wasn't done. I, I think they didn't post a performance guarantee and the plan did not get recorded, did get recorded, it but, get recorded. but um, nothing ever triggered their obligations to uh, 
uh, upgrade the roadway. So that's part of what's going on uh, here. Uh, whereas they had just the, this was the last lot in their project, uh, as Maureen said, we're now seeking approval to add two more lots to what the current existing approved plan is, um, which is what we had done in 2012. The access is going to be over the existing uh, Golden Ridge Lane up to about five or 600 feet in. That roadway will be extended to serve the additional lots created on this plan. Um, and there will be some improvements to the road. It's, it's a varying width now. It's a gravel roadway, has a water line in it, some utility, uh, power utilities. Uh, it is going to be, as part of this, it'll be widened to a consistent width of 18 feet uh, throughout its entire length. There's going to be uh, the existing utility, water utility in the roadway will be upgraded to an eight inch line. Fire hydrants are gonna be added in a couple of locations uh, and uh, in order to serve the, the new lots, that's why there'll be a larger line. All the existing uh, any existing home that's tied into that line will have the ability to, in addition, um, uh, there are two lots on the left side of the road as you're going in, owned by Amy Powell. I believe their current house is actually served directly from the street, but if they want to tie into the line, they'd be allowed to. And she has a vacant lot to the rear of her uh, their house lot and they've, they've been uh, allowed to tie into this uh, water line as well to pull a service off of it. Um, we have uh, requested a waiver on the roadway width as was noted in the memo. Uh, we think the waiver, that's what was granted before, we think the waiver is appropriate. There's going to be very light traffic use on this road. Uh, we think that there's not uh, any real likelihood of extending the road any further than what uh, is shown on this plan. And uh, uh, we think that widening the road to the 22 feet would actually create some additional uh, dilemmas or problems with handling water, increase uh, sort of an impervious surface that uh, would, isn't necessarily needed in this particular case. Um, we aren't proposing any uh, other covenants or restrictions on the property. It will be just three residential lots for single family use. Um, as Maureen noted, we provided a road maintenance agreement. She pointed out to us, and just for one thing, the, the road maintenance agreement is not yet recorded. It's been executed and we actually hold an original. Maureen pointed out that we should revise it and re-execute it in order to make reference to any uh, re-approved plan at this point, and we would do so. Um, then there were just, uh, uh, thank you Maureen for, I had two points of clarification. Maureen had noted about the watershed divide line. It's shown on this plan. I think there was some question, and I appreciate Maureen giving the more detailed history, which she knows much better than I, but um, sheets A and B, which are the overall drainage plan, actually those are sealed by uh, Les Barrier BH2M and they show the geometry of the line, the location of the line, and the uh, which direction the water is draining and why that line was moved at some point in the process, or re revisited and then uh, re-identified in its correct location. Um, and I think Maureen pointed out to me that at some point in the materials we submitted, we mentioned that there weren't going to be any changes to Golden Ridge Rent Lane, and obviously, there are, and so I guess that was a misstatement. The materials describe, uh, as they had before at our last meeting, the, uh, the nature of the improvements in terms of the gravel, the uh, shoulders are gonna be provided, the utilities will be installed, and uh, the extension of the road, obviously. Finally, uh, we reviewed the conditions that Maureen had uh, proposed or suggested, and uh, our client has no objections to any of those, and they're all satisfactory to us. And with that, I would be happy to uh, answer any questions the board has. Thank you. Does the board have any questions for the applicant at this time? Marie, I was excuse me, involved in the, uh, the previous school. And my understanding correctly that we put all this stuff together, we're essentially reapproving what was already approved, so there 
do not appear to be new issues before the board no. have already been signed. Yeah, all the issues that were out there before have been resolved, and this is intended to be just a reapproval of something that should have been recorded before it expired. Just revising what's already been. What about the issue that the engineer picked up, Maureen, about um, the plans are at a different scale, requires a waiver? How do we technically? You, you've, that's very standard. You've done that in the past. You're, and, you know, you're all experts at the subdivision ordinance since you've spent so long with it. And you remember the submission requirements require a one inch equals 40 scale. And if you do something larger than that, you need a waiver. And so that's the only thing he's mentioning. And if you deem this complete, you am, you're granting that waiver. Okay. And, and you did last time. Okay. I just I wasn't sure how we grant that. Okay. So it's implicit. We don't need to exit. Yeah. We you've never done an an actual formal waiver. It's just once you deem it complete, basically anything that isn't submitted is considered to be not necessary to be submitted. Okay. Anyone have any questions on on the scale of the plans? No. So just to be clear, we're considering completing this first, right? You, you, it's like a brand new project. Mm -hmm. one, one last thing. Um, the condition on like, activities outside the building of work, um, through a submission someplace or other, if the applicant wanted to have any lawn space outside of the building of work, the way it now reads would be permitted. Yeah, and, and this is, I mean, we have new code officer, so there is a fresh set of eyes are looking at these conditions. And typically, we write a condition that says that you can't do anything in the build, outside the building envelope. The, you can put in driveways, you can install utilities, and that's it. And the philosophy behind that has been that for, uh, again, going back to the subdivision ordinance that we all hold near and dear, there is a buffer standard that says you have to create a buffer between the new subdivision and the existing properties. And most of the time, what people will do is they'll say, okay, I promise to leave the existing vegetation, and that will be the buffer. So it saves them money, they're able to meet the standard, and the board accepts that as long as there's something there growing. But the idea is if you then allow people to go in and muck around outside the building envelope, your so-called buffer often gets destroyed. Because I don't think a lawn without any vegetation in it is a buffer. So the standard you usually have is you can't do anything in it. And we've started to get some people who are pushing back and like, well, I'd like a lawn or I'd like this and I'd like that. And I'm, I'm saying in my, my understanding is you have to leave it alone. But I wanted to bring that to the board because I wanted to confirm that that is the board's intent. What? Okay. Yes, Jim. One thing is, I mean, there's a difference between a buffer around the perimeter of the subdivision and a buffer around the perimeter of each lot. And the way it's worded is you're not allowed to do anything with the, in the unbuildable portion of the lot, which would almost suggest that you have existing vegetation across your front. And most people have lawn right down to the street and maybe vegetation on either side, but definitely that, that seems like very, that what we want to make sure we have is the perimeter around the entire subdivision here. So I'm not sure how you'd word that, but not exactly. Um, I noted that too. I was going to bring that up in the second half after completeness, but now that we're um, discussing it, um, I was actually going to ask the applicant, did you want to reduce the um, setback, I mean, not the setback, but what we do in the building envelope, such as Joe's discussing, uh, lot three would be on the east side and lot four would be on the west side. And, and Lee, I, I, I'm kind of scraping this out of my memory. I yeah. believe there were some questions raised in my office regarding eliminating vegetation in the buffer to grab a view of Great Pond. I'm going to say that my, um, that was the same condition that was uh, extant before or requested before. Um, I was never told by either by John Mitchell or by my client that that as a condition was a concern or a problem. So I'm not going to, uh, we, I've seen the restriction and uh, it's pretty, 
broad range, but that's what it was, and, and I can't stand here and say there's, a, there's an objection. I guess what I would ask is um, whether, as a matter of um, uh, practice in the town, how would that be treated for an individual lot owner if, if an owner of lot three wanted to come in and uh, seek their own individual permission to make some amendment or revision to the prohibition for a specific purpose, that would be, you know, we're, we're not going to, we wouldn't propose to stand in the way of that. Uh, I don't know, and Maureen, you may have, you, I'm sure you have better information. Um, like a, a large portion of those areas is already encumbered by the watershed divide line, and I don't know if that means you can't can't do anything in there as well. I, you know, I don't know what the restriction is the there. Areas, the areas where you have the RP1 buffer and the RP1 wetland really are areas where you, there, are, there are many, there are other reasons why you shouldn't be removing vegetation in mm -hmm. those areas. But areas that are upland, that are not yeah. in a buffer, uh, the only restriction for removing the vegetation is because they're outside the building envelope. So, so here's the building not free, am I correct? The building envelope. Right, and that's what they, right, but they. So within that, they can have all the ones they want. I, that's what I, I just, like I said, I've been asked this question by the code officer. He's, he's looking at these notes, he's getting questions, and he's saying, if it says you can't do anything else, then you can't do anything else. He's, and if you don't like you can't do anything else, then you need to go back to the planning board and get that amended. So since we're here, I thought I'd make sure that's what you meant. Elaine? My recollection from when we did a site walk on this property is that we were intentional about the building envelope and I'd be reluctant to just move it out without taking another look at the property and I question whether that's something, if the applicant doesn't really, isn't really pushing to do that, I would be disinclined to do that. Thank you. Anyone else? I agree with Elaine. I would say I have to agree because that's why I posed the question first to you, and I'm not hearing no. anything. I have no basis to uh, request anything other than. Okay. Any other, Joe? Um, Do you want to follow? Yeah, I mean, I basically I agree with Elaine, but I'm just wondering if going forward, is it usual on a subdivision to identify a subdivision buffer that, like, literally a line goes like this around the whole? subdivision and says this is the subdivision buffer? What we've typically done is we've used the building envelope technique because it seems, I mean, we, we really want to make this as simple to understand as possible because if it's simple to understand, the chances of it actually being followed are higher. So the whole idea of you have to put everything you want inside the box is pretty simple. The other thing about it is that if you have a lot that has, you know, natural features that you want preserved, it's easy to constrain the building envelope more severely than you would constrain it with setbacks and still preserve those features. So what we typically do is we use a building envelope as opposed to a designating specific buffers. But I think we did um, mandate buffering plantation be planted. Yes, there, there um, were recently. two places um, down where the, existing, where, where the existing Golden Ridge Lane ends, basically, where additional plantings were installed. And that's, that's a good example of how you don't require plantings all the way around a subdivision, because you, instead you rely on preserving the existing vegetation and having that serve the function of the buffer. Okay. Any other questions on the buffering? Okay. Um, is there a general agreement then where we're going to keep the buffering as it is on this plan? Okay. I'm seeing a lot of nods. All right. Um, I was going to save this for the second half, but while we're bringing up items, um, item uh, note number 14 on plan, I believe this is A. No, sheet number one, excuse me. Uh, of the plan set or, of the, or on the subdivision plan itself? On the amended subdivision. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we have two sheet number number one. Okay. The reason I bring up item number fourteen, note number fourteen, it says activities outside the building envelope are restricted to the installation of driveway, utilities, and trails. Mm -hmm. Are you rethinking the trails, or you want to scrub those words? 
entrails. Would you like to remove the entrails? I'm happy to leave trails. So if somebody who owns one of these lots wants to work with the town about the conservation trail and the green belt, then they can do so. We're not, we're not prohibiting it uh, among our lot owners. Is McMorrin, would that be fine to leave or is well, now that we're... Since we wanted a trail originally, I, I mean, it's not a use that's inconsistent with what you had originally intended. Okay. And we will keep that. And my last note would be on the uh, signing block, where it says um, it says approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. It has a line for the date, and it has a line where the chairman signs. We could just strike that to say chair instead of chairman. Yeah. That's okay. And did anyone else have anything? I think we've gone beyond completeness, but is there anything else anyone may have had? No, then at this point, would somebody like to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Okay, thank you. All right, um, motion for the board to consider. Motion for completeness. Be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Golden Ridge LLC for a three-lot subdivision located at the end of Golden Ridge Lane be deemed complete. Okay. Second. Second. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay. Any discussion? And then um, all those in favor of completeness and opposed? Okay. That passes. All right, um, then at this point, um, let's see. I do have a question about the next point. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Are we, are we required to hold a public hearing? No. Okay. I was, yes, do, does the members of the board wish to hold a public hearing or a site walk? I'd like to hear people's no. views. No. No to the public hearing, no to the site walk? Joe, would you want to add more? Hmm? No? no? Okay. All right, then at this point, um, would anyone like to make a motion for um, approval? Sure, I will. All right, motion for approval. Findings of fact. One, Golden Ridge LLC is requesting reapproval of a three lot subdivision located at the end of Golden Ridge Lane, which requires review under section 16 2 3, minor subdivision review. Number two, a road maintenance agreement is needed to assure that the private road will be maintained as shown on the approved plan. Number three, it is the planning board's intent that the entire length of Golden Ridge Lane from its intersection with Route 77 to the full length terminating at lots three and four as proposed on the plan submitted for the April 22, 2013 meeting be constructed to provide a minimum 18 inch gravel base, 18 inch um, 18 feet wide to accommodate town emergency vehicles. Number four, the applicant has provided the town with an executed performance guarantee. Number five, activities outside the building envelope shall be limited to preserve existing natural veget vegetation as a buffer to abutting properties. And number six, the application substantially complies with section 16-3-1 subdivision review standards. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Golden Ridge LLC for a three-lot subdivision located at the end of Golden Ridge Lane be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that a road maintenance agreement referencing the plans approved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Planning Board on April 22, 2013 be recorded in a form acceptable to the town attorney and town manager. Number two, that a complete HHE 200 form be submitted and approved by the code enforcement officer prior to the issuance of a building permit for lot five. Number three, that activities outside the building envelope be limited to the minimal amount of vegetation removal necessary to install driveways and utilities and that existing vegetation be preserved in its natural state to buffer the subdivision from abutting properties. Do we wanna add trails to that condition? Okay, so um, I want to re-word re condition number three. That activities outside the building envelope be limited to the minimum amount of vegetation removal necessary to install driveways, utilities, and trails, and that existing vegetation be pre 
preserved in its natural state to buffer the subdivision from abutting properties. And number four, that there be no alteration of the site nor issuance of a building permit until the town planner confirms that the above conditions have been satisfied. Second. Okay, second by Carol Ann. Um, Maureen, was there something, I've made a note to myself that the plans be amended from October 30th to some uh, closer date, to reflect a more closer date. Was that in here? It's, it's not in your motion, but I, it's, it's my intent that the plan that you will be presented in for you to sign will have the date of tonight's meeting. Okay, do we actually have to make that? No? no? Okay. Just be intent. All right. Um, any other discussion on the motion? Oh, all those in favor? That would be five, and I'll be abstaining. And the motion passes. Thank you very much for your time once again, and uh, hopefully we don't have to return. The next item on our agenda is <coughs> day camp amendment. The town council has referred to the planning board a request to amend the zoning ordinance to allow summer day camps. The draft amendment creates a definition of day camp and makes it a permitted use in residential and business districts. The amendment will be reviewed in compliance with section 19-7-3 zoning amendments. And this will be um, addressed in the following manner. The town planner will provide a summary of the item, followed by a public hearing. Then the board may discuss the item, followed by a vote. Maureen, would you like to provide a summary, please? Yes, I would. And I'm going to send this way. Um, you've received many emails over the years. Your rule has been that anything that comes the day of the meeting, you also want a paper copy. So I'm passing on these as your paper copies. This was something you already received in the mail today. So if you checked your email, you probably saw it. Anyway, um, the reason this is before the planning board is that the town council has asked the planning board to consider an amendment to allow limited summer day camps. And the reason it's being proposed is because last year, the former code officer made a determination that an existing limited summer day camp that was being operated was not a permitted use unless it, was, unless it could be treated as either a, day care, a home day care or a day camp facility. And since that particular summer day camp had received neither approval, it wasn't allowed. So I, I bring this up because if, if you believe that having these limited summer day camps is not a bad thing for the town, we still need to realign the town's values with the interpretation of the code officer. Now, the new code officer, I, we've gone over this definition, uh, he does agree that it would be better to have something clear in the ordinance that makes it clear that you can do these kind of things if this is what you want to do. So the, there's the proposal before you is to have a new definition called a day camp that would join the daycare home and the daycare facility definitions we already have. And that would limit the day camp to no more than four weeks in the summer, no more than six weeks in the year. It would be no more than four hours a day. And it's limited to, I believe, six children. And I do want to point out that you have received comments that six is a little small if you're trying to create two teams, which I thought was a pretty compelling argument myself. Anyway, um, if the board is interested, you have scheduled a public hearing for this evening. Clearly, many, many people have come for the public hearing. I, I, had, I did receive a phone call from a, 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 college, a young college man who's currently in college in Colorado and was inquiring about being able to run a camp like this this summer, one week here and one week in Cumberland. And I told him, by the way, it may not be permitted. So there is still some interest in this. And that's, I'll stop now. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, we did receive a number of emails supporting day camps. Um, we did not receive any correspondence opposing day camps. I am opening up the public hearing, but uh, for the record, town hall is empty. So I will close the public hearing, and, um, and I would ask anyone have any comments to discuss this? I do. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I read through this, it seemed to me that the number of children and the limit on the amount of time was 
uh, kind of minimal. And so I look back at the uh, home daycare and uh, definitions, and I notice that those are conditional uses. And I can't remember if we had any discussion about whether this would, should be a conditional use or not. But it seems like it would be a really good idea. Um, did, did, am I going over territory we went over? No, I was just going to respond because we did have the discussion and just sort of, I think one of the reasons that it is for a very few number of children and for very short time periods was to provide some access for this to occur as a routine matter in a residential neighborhood without a conditional use permit. But that if it were for a longer period of time or for a greater number of children, then the conditional use permit might be more appropriate. So that's why it seems to be a very small box that we've drawn here. But see, what I like about the conditional use permit is it, the, it goes before the zoning board and one of the things they look at is that the proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions. And it seems that potentially the most problematic aspect of this is the drop-off and pickup period. And especially on some of the smaller roads, the crowding. And um, if you go before the zoning board, that aspect of the camp would at least be thought through. Um, by more than the applicant themselves. Would you be asking under the conditional use to increase the number of uh, children that would attend, or are you looking um, that this should well, be Well, yeah, I think that also time? you could, if you, I mean, in some cases, there are certainly some properties where you could have 20 kids, where, you know, if you had a big property and you know, a big long driveway so you could really get people deep in and off the road, it wouldn't really make sense to limit the number of people in the camp to f six. Whereas on a, you know, on a small road with a small house and a lot of congestion, you wouldn't want 20 people dropping off your kids all at the same time. So what I like, again, about the conditional use is it gives some ability to kind of think through what might be most appropriate for a particular property. Any comments on increasing numbers or the time frame? Well, I, it's, I, I think it's a good idea, but I'm still a little bit troubled about the blanket insertion in residential districts of something which would be it require a, you know another look and a conditional use permit if it were just a little bit bigger but we somehow think by shrinking it we've made it no longer a problem and it, it will be allowed as of right um, the number of kids issue also i think yeah, fairly can be thought of in terms of the noise factor and disruption in a residential neighborhood in some places it might be great in other neighborhoods with small lots, houses close together, it, it might be a problem. I, I, I think Joe has the right handle on the numbers. It's really dependent on the size of the property, the situation, even to the kind of day camp that's being run. Um, the other two are clearly contemplated to be run as businesses and, and people are staffing for a daycare operation and so forth. This is none of that and it's even to be run by high school kids. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's really squishy. I, I find myself with mixed emotions about this. Any other thoughts and comments um, about, yes, Elaine? I guess one of the questions I would have, if we go that direction, and I can see a good reason to do it, is there any point in having a day camp as something different from a home daycare or a daycare facility? And what differences would we be identifying? Or are, are we really leading up to saying, well, it's really already covered by the categories we have? Or would we want to identify? Well, it wouldn't be subject to the same standards there's, I, I don't remember what they are offhand, but there's a list of standards for 
home daycare and daycare facility outlining place, you know, yard and amount of space, I think. But uh, some of those might apply if it were large enough. I think if we're going to go that route, we have to take, we have to start ag again and take a much more detailed look at what kind of conditions we might apply to a day camp that we might not apply to a daycare center. I don't, I, See, I guess if we're going that's to do that, why, we need to go back to workshop again. That's why, though, I was thinking if you said it, if you had it as a conditional use, the zoning board has at least some oversight over those conditions. I mean, I don't think, I don't think you want a tremendous amount of conditions on this. I think you want it fairly minimal, but I mean, I think it would be good to look at traffic. They look at uh, whether the proposed use will create unsanitary conditions by reasons of sewage disposal. I mean, they have like six items that they look at, just pretty fairly minimal. Um, and they look at them for the other two as well, the daycare and the home daycare. I just want to make sure you, you understand that I think if you go this route, you're pretty much shutting this use down because it's, I mean, all the feedback we've gotten is that this is pretty much run by teenagers, young college students. Those people aren't going to go through a zoning board approval process for something they're only running for a couple of weeks every summer. And, and that's fine if you have concerns and you want it to go through a zoning board process. I don't want to rain on that parade, but my understanding is this has been going on for years and you know, we've never gotten a complaint. To follow up on that, um, I would point out that we did receive this item from the council. And when the council made their recommendation, uh, they wanted us to keep these, they call them summer day camps, which we've actually taken a step. And we've added two weeks that are not in the summer. But they actually called them summer day camps. And they said small and limited. So I'm, ta I'm taking my cue from the council. And um, I believe keeping them small and limited was why we initially chose six and we initially said it wouldn't go for zoning because it would be a small number for a small time frame which actually we've extended as i mentioned and um and i i don't want them to grow or get any bigger or especially the time frame because um when i was looking up um, the state's definition somebody said these should be licensed we did get a comment these should be licensed so i looked that up under t Title 22, MRSA Section 8301-8, Subsection 1A, licensing is required for um, family child care providers and child care facilities. And what sets them apart from what we have, a day camp, what sets them apart from a day camp is um, that they are regular. If you look at the definition, it'll say a regular program of care and protection. And uh, regular meaning stable, steady, constant hours um, and weeks of operation, where we're saying um, this will have limited. So there we have our contrast right there. By limiting the hours and the weeks of operation, we are not sliding into something that actually needs state licensing. And I was thinking if we continue to just keep it small and simple, you also do have the benefit of if this is something some teenagers want to do, then they can do it without having to schedule the zoning and hoping, as it is, we're already getting um, emails saying, I think now it's too late to set something up in August, and we're trying to rush this through. And uh, so those are my thoughts, but I'd like to hear again from members of the board. Maureen, do you know from the existing day camps that they have had whether the limit of six is is that basically going to kill off a lot of the ones that would be? I don't know. I, I mean, I, these are so low key that, you know, we, I didn't even know they existed until the code officer made his determination last summer. And then I heard that, I heard, I mean, I think Liza made a contribution that she partook of one and I heard about them and, you know, they tend to be, they're very small and they tend to be, I've talked to the mother of one person who ran it and that's my whole perspective. Uh, we've heard some from Liza, we've heard from a couple of other people, but usually it's a couple of teenagers and it's eight to ten kids. 
and you know, in, in a place where we are very careful about take care, we've never gotten a complaint. Any comments? Um, yeah, I like the, the 10 kid limit more than the six. Mm -hmm. It seems more reasonable. Elaine? I would be very reluctant from, I would be very reluctant to approve it with a 10 child limit. I think one, if you get, I think there's a difference between having six children playing in, in a next door yard in a small lot neighborhood and having 10 children playing outside. And since we don't make any requirements in terms of supervision, I think we're looking at potentially a very different activity and really a very difficult situation to regulate. So I would, I'm not in, I would not be in favor of it. I, I, the idea of having teams, I think that's a great thing, but I, I just think we would then have to start looking at it neighborhood by neighborhood, site by site, if we're talking about having 10 children there. It may work fine in some places where it's happening now, but I can imagine a lot of places where it would not be fine. Mm -hmm. I guess you just have to get two camps to play each other. <laughs> <laughs> they could do that. I had I, I, six, eight, and I'm not sure where to draw the line. The other thing that has bothered me, though, and I would propose language to meet it, is that when we specify children under 16 um, for the headcount of, of day campers, and the four hours, say, between the hours of X and Y, with noise levels not to exceed normal levels of children at play, um, because this will be allowed as of right, I think you have to create some, it'd be a good idea to create some mechanism where a day camp that was being run to the annoyance of the neighbors, and you know, as my example of the drum and bugle corps day camp, that I think it would be nice to build a limit of that type in there that, you know, at least you give the people running the day camp, uh, I'll put them on notice that they have to keep things under control. Okay, um, so you'd actually like to uh, put a time frame, what time these can start? Well, the four hours, I think between, I, 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 Maureen, once again, I don't know what the actual, is it usually a morning day camp or an afternoon day camp? What I heard was, again, you know, and I only, I only, I put out the word, we put it out on the website, we put it in the courier, and nobody called, and either they called, they didn't call because they didn't want us to know they were doing it, um, <laughs> <laughs> or they didn't know about it, or they just, you know, don't want to call. But what I heard from the one person was nine to one, was what they usually did. She was pretty adamant that, you know, you didn't really want them there more than four hours a day. There was sometimes some one of the kids might stay a little later because someone had a doctor's appointment, but it was, you know, pretty much half day, no more than four weeks of summer. You know, I think the idea is to try to strike a balance between allowing this as of right in a way that you're uncomfortable with and, and really making it a very narrow type of activity. I mean, to me, between nine and three would be a decent window for that four hour day camp to happen. <clears throat> so it could, you know, run a little later or you know, a little bit earlier, but not something that would start at seven in the morning or run till six, you know, in the late afternoon. Um, so it's, when you mentioned the time limit, what came to my mind is eight to four, which is kind of normal work work hours. It, it fits better with more normal work hours. The, That's true. Eight is probably a, you know eight doesn't seem too early and four doesn't seem too late. But somewhere in that, what four-hour block they choose in there right. is up to them. But. Sounds good. Elaine, do you have any thoughts on that? You. Like a little. I guess, you know, if you're thinking about parents coming home from work, working in Portland, and they want to do an afternoon, they're not going to be home by 4 o'clock, I guess. I'd be more inclined to, if we're going to put a time in, I'd be more inclined to do like 8 to 6. I mean, it's, it's not an yeah. overnight thing, yeah. it's, and it's only four hours. Any other thoughts but, about including a time frame and what it should be? On the other hand, if, if one day a week, they wanted to have a bonfire.
for their six kids and it's after six o'clock, they couldn't do it. And I'm not sure I really care about that. <laughs> and I think that would be fine in the summer, you know, it's, it's light till really late in the evening, so. And shoot off some fireworks, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a different story. Not so I'm, I'm, I don't know that we, I'm not all that inclined to think that we need to limit the time since it can be only for four hours. I think saying something about you know, normal noise levels to avoid the outdoor band camp probably is a good idea. Um, not, not, you remember the short-term mental work we did, well, which was then followed by amendments to the miscellaneous offenses ordinance, which regulates noise. And yeah. that already has been, that language has already been strengthened to talk about what's expected during daytime hours and nighttime hours in terms of normal levels, so. Couldn't play a band, you couldn't play band instruments outside? It talks about what is reasonably expected in the community uh, based on a community standard and you, you can play band instruments outside but if you're gonna put your speaker at the window and, and, turn, and crank it and a neighbor complains and a police officer comes and he says this isn't reasonable, then you have to turn it down. Yeah, I struggle with this because um, where I came out on short-term rentals is that it's not consistent with a single family use. And I don't think this is either. I think it's people exploiting their lovely waterfront properties as a money-making opportunity and disturbing the neighbors. <laughs> and I, I don't see them that different from each other. But when your but, child's getting ready to go to college, does, don't you want them, I mean, here's an opportunity for some 17-year-old to earn some some money. Yeah, or they could also rent out my house when I went on vacation and make even more money. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's fair to the neighbors. So that's my view. Um, and, and I think that the ordinance is pretty narrowly written, single family use. Um, but I feel like we came up with a compromise for short term rentals. And as it's written right now, I think represents a fair compromise. It won't impinge too much as on the neighbors. Written, as this is written. Yeah, as proposed. So, um. because as as one of our one of our correspondents stated, uh, lesson learned: talk to your neighbors. Um, and I mean, you can't legislate that. It's kind of hard to put it in an ordinance, but one would hope that people in the neighborhood, before especially a tight knit neighborhood like you guys live in that someone would speak to their neighbors before they invited uh, six, eight, ten, whatever kids into their yard five days a week for four hours a day for a week or two. So, and I guess uh, it's like common sense. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> point. No, it's right. You, you're right. Any other comments? Does at this time, do we want to add any language about what time they can drop off and pick up? What am I hearing? I, I would propose that we specify children under age 16, which I think is actually what they do for daycare as well. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, any thoughts on just adding that provision for? So when we say what children, that, what about children over 16? This doesn't apply. It's not a day camp. Are you proposing so that we say a program of care and instruction for children age 16 or younger for no more than six children so that it isn't a day camp at all unless the children are under 16? Right. Okay. Would that be okay to add the age restriction for children 16 or younger? Everyone agree on that one? Okay. And I'm not really hearing about what we want to do around drop off and pick up. Um, anyone want to get? I'm going to, I'm going to support Elaine's position on that. Um, that just the common, common usage, the average, average, there, the intent is the children will not be there all day, but if they should have an afternoon one, so it goes from one to five. The f I think the four hours will take care of it. Will take care of the limits on the beginning and end of the day. 
Okay, that's and down here. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, my the only my reason for uh, wanting to look at the traffic was to increase the number of campers, but I think mm -hmm. six is if it's not a problem. And this will be going to the town council, and, and they'll be reviewing it also. Okay. Any other changes or comments about this? No. Um, I, I do also view it as um, sort of a compromise. I, I agree with you, Liza. Um, and I think it's a good compromise. Um, I think it's good because the town council does support it, and so I do wish to support them. I think it's good because it does contrast from the definition of the home daycare and the daycare facilities, um, so it does not require licensing. Um, I will support this because the, then the proposed day camp amendment would lift the restriction that is now placed um, by the former code enforcement officer. And finally, um, I do feel that the proposed day camp promotes neighbors supporting neighbors uh, through limited recreational, educational, or fine arts related opportunities for our school aged children under 16. So at this time, would anyone like to make a motion? I will. <laughs> Thank you. Be it ordered that based on the information presented and the comments received, the planning board recommends the day care, the day camp amendments to the town council for consideration. As amended. As amended. Okay. I'll second that. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Then all those in favor? That's unanimous. And all those opposed? Okay, unanimously passes. Okay. Very good. Um, now we're at adjournment. Okay, uh, motion for adjournment? Motion we adjourn. Second? Second. Thank you. Discussion? All those in favor? And we are adjourned.